Welcome everyone. I'm Megan Zottarelli, Assistant Director of Policy at Sword Supply Shares and your facilitator for today's online workshop on Program Evaluation, the Structured Interview. This workshop is organized by the Institute for Veteran Policy at Sword Supply Shares as part of our technical assistance series for grantees of our California and Texas Veteran Employment and Training Collaborative. This workshop will cover structured interviews as part of your program evaluation process. We'll cover conducting structured interviews as part of intake, pre-post assessment and exiting your program, issues and questions you hope to address using a structured interview, structured interview versus self-completed questionnaire, and interview skills and techniques. This is an online workshop, however, we do encourage you to be active participants, able to ask and answer questions, as well as participate in exercises throughout the presentation. So some general housekeeping before we begin. During this workshop, you may type a question to the panelist or to Sword Supply Share staff at any time. Simply type your questions in the questions box on the right side of this webinar's display. Then at the end of the presentation, we will review the questions and comments posted and generate a discussion. We'll also provide opportunities to engage during the workshop through poll questions as well. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be archived on the Sword Supply Shares YouTube channel. So we'll email you copies of the PowerPoint following the presentation as well as a handout and notify you when the webinar is archived and available to watch. Our presenter for today's workshop is Wendy Mellick, Principal of, of VisitorStudies.com. Wendy has two decades of experience evaluating programs and in informal education centers throughout the Western U.S. She wrestles with research questions which range from simple program-related logistics to deep explorations of subtle and sophisticated areas of human thought and endeavor with people of all types. Her work provides decision makers with valid, actionable data. Wendy holds an MA in Museum Studies from San Francisco State University and BAs in Anthropology and Business and a Certificate of Latin American Studies from Michigan State University. In addition to designing and conducting research, she frequently provides professional development in the form of workshops, lectures, and keynote addresses at institutions, professional conferences, and universities. You may remember her from our last in-person workshop. You can learn more about Wendy's work at visitorstudies.com. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Kevin, for your technical support. There's one more person I want to thank, and that's Mary Mann here at uh, the SWORDS office for producing these slides and making them so lovely. Now, when it comes to these slides, I won't be reading everything in them, so if I seem to skip over something or you need more explanation, please do uh, send a little chat message to Megan and she'll let me know. Um, in addition to presenting you with a lot of information and some ideas, I hope to be stretching your thinking. I do come to this from a little bit different angle than many of you do, and I, a new perspective can often unfold, unfold new ideas and new ways of doing things. We're definitely uh, going through that here at SWORDS as I learn more about their evaluation process. Um, I also want to give you an, t an opportunity to chime in, as I mentioned, because you have a lot of experience talking to people in your world, and I'm sure we can learn from each other. So we will be covering a range of topics that Megan has already mentioned. I want to note that at the very end, I'll be talking briefly about analysis and coding and data management. Um, coding and analysis could be a whole workshop in itself and if that's something you find useful and uh, interesting we can consider doing that uh, later in the year. So I want to put structured interviews in the context of survey tools in general. Um, probably the most common thing that people are familiar with in survey tools is a self-completed questionnaire form either online or on paper. Uh, a rigidly structured interview is essentially like a questionnaire form, uh, but there's a human asking the questions. And how structured or semi-structured the interview is depends on how you've created your protocol. How free form are you willing to be in conversation and how rigid or strict do you feel you need to be. Truly open-ended interviews are pretty rare. Um, I have used them in an open-ended interview, I'll go in with a few big questions and not a lot of opinion 
about where I'm going to go. I'm really following the lead of the uh, respondent. And those are good fishing explorations in order to inform the development of more structured interviews where you can get a little more standardized at the data you're hearing. But when you're not sure what to expect from respondents, it's nice to start with an open-ended exercise like that. So interviews and uh, self-completed forms, really common survey tools. They do have different strengths and weaknesses, of course. Uh, interviews tend to be a little more labor intensive. Questionnaires are easier to deal with uh, because you don't need interview skills, you just need recruiting skills. Um, clearly in an interview you can follow up for clarity, which is something you can't do in a questionnaire form. Your data tend to be a little richer because you've been able to follow up and probe for clarity and completeness when you're dealing with interviews. And uh, a really nice thing about interviews is you're having a conversation, you're in the space with someone usually, unless you're working on the phone. And uh, that means you have opportunities to use other things in addition to questions such as card sorts. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, anonymity is always an important question. Certainly somebody who's filling out a questionnaire can be more anonymous depending on the conditions. When you're working with clients, of course, anonymity isn't an issue in terms of that data collection interaction usually. Um, even if you're not collecting information about the individual respondents such that they're remaining anonymous, you're still face to face with the person and you need to be aware of something that's called the courtesy bias. So the courtesy bias is people's natural tendency to be friendly at you. They don't want to hurt your feelings by giving negative feedback or they might want to craft their responses to show themselves in the best possible light. So it's something to be aware of that your data um, in a face to face interview may be a little bit friendlier towards your issues and questions than you will you can find in a self-completed questionnaire. It's a pretty well documented phenomenon and something that I have seen in my data as well. You can also use a combination of interviews and questionnaires. Uh, that's not an uncommon, uncommon thing. Um, certain time, it, it, certain kinds of demographics or other perfunctory items like how did you learn about this program, those are easily handled by a self-completed instrument. <clears throat> and it's not unusual for me to have somebody either do that before I talk with them, depending on what the situation is, or after I manage the chatting part of the interview, I'll have them complete the demographics for me. Let's see here. I think that skipped. Oh, no, it didn't. Okay. So when you are gearing up to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we're missing a slide that I do want to talk to you about and we'll put it in before uh, this is final. Taking advantage of, you want to use the advantage of the structured interview, which is being able to have a conversation with somebody. And Again, some questions lend themselves to that better than in a self-completed instrument where you're going to need to probe for clarity and understanding. A really common use of them is in employment placement interviews and that's something I know you all know a lot about. They're also very useful for exit interviews with staff and clients as people are moving on away from the organization or from that program. They can be very useful for exploring potential partnerships with other service providers. And when you are talking with people through and designing your a protocol for a structured interview in any of these settings, it's nice to uh, consider both the outputs or the activities that you're examining or considering as well as the resulting outcomes. What are the improvements to, uh, what are the improvements to the quality of life of the client? Now we're up to this slide that's on your screen right now. When you're planning your research, of course, it's important to gather input from all stakeholders. I know your fund, all funders have different kinds of reporting requirements. Your in-house development staff may be working on a project and be able to 
give you input about useful information that you could be gathering for whatever your research effort is. And it's important to bring people to the table who are responsible for the data collection and data management. Uh, different logistics present different challenges for data collection and the people that are at the front lines doing that will help you from the get-go be most efficient as you design your protocol. Um, we'll talk about prototyping and uh, pilot testing, but the more information you can have from the beginning to make it the smoothest effort possible, the better off everyone will be. It's important to get those challenging logistics on your radar at the beginning. Now, it seems frightfully obvious to say this uh, out loud, but it's important to get consensus on the reason for the research before you get going. Um, it's human nature to leap into uh, application or implementation, but you need to have your ducks in a row first. So what is the reason for the research? And what are your research questions and how will you use the findings? I want to note here that research questions almost never end up in your interview or questionnaire protocol. Um, research questions are overarching big issues usually uh, that don't come down to the level of individual questions for respondents. And the best example I can think of for you about that is um, working on a project where we were trying to understand how much these online games got users to metacognate about their own behaviors. So you'll never see the word metacognition in a question for a respondent, even if that's something that's being looked at by the research. So, ah, there's the using structured interviews slide one notch out of order. I apologize for that. All right, getting back to best practices um, in research uh, in general, you must match the methodology to the research question, the purpose. Uh, and that's why one reason you need to be very, very clear what your purpose is and what you're trying to learn about before you understand which tool is going to be the most effective. Uh, when it comes to questionnaires and uh, structured interviews, there are some kinds of things that people can reflect on more comfortably in writing without standing there or sitting there face to face with someone. So um, it, depending on your research questions and your logistics, people might have an easier time reflecting on personal growth or personal benefit. That said, some people might need a little encouragement to get to the kinds of things that you're interested in hearing about. This is where pilot testing your instrument can come and really help, be very helpful. I have commented a couple times on pilot testing. It's important to test not just the instrument but and your data collection process, but also your data management process and, if possible, analysis tools. The more complex your situation, the more important this is. You don't want to have your sample completed and then find that one of the questions actually wasn't asked quite right and now that you look at the data, it's being confusing. Something that comes up a lot is uh, the question of sample size. Now, for a lot of your situations where you'll be using, where you use uh, structured interviews, sample size isn't an issue when you know you're going to be doing a set interview with, um, say, each exiting person uh, who's, who's been through your program and is now moving on. Then sample size isn't an issue. When you are polling uh, to look at maybe program development, uh, then this can come into play. Um, statistics, if you're looking for statistical security or surety, then you're dealing with very large sample sizes for a quantitative study. Qualitative studies that aren't too complex can get away with a sample of about 40 or sometimes 50. Uh, if you find a lot of agreement in your data, then you're safe with a smaller sample. And I'm the sample size can be pretty specific to situation, so I'm happy to entertain any questions about that and get more specific for you. Uh, working bilingually 
can be really necessary and it's easy to do badly. Uh, most of you, I'm going to guess, are dealing with Spanish-English situations when you do have a bilingual need. And as we know, language can be very colloquial. So it's important to work with a native speaker who knows the Spanish from the region of most of the people in the population that you're going to be talking to. Um, often it's easy to find someone in-house that can help with that. Uh, if you're not working with professional translators or, or uh, particularly um, highly educated people that are helping, it's helpful to have back translate. So you have one person translate your instrument from English to Spanish, a separate person back translate it to English, see how well it matches. One thing that people often don't remember is that if you are working bilingually, you're going to end up with a bunch of bilingual data. So be ready to, uh, with your resources, uh, ready to be able to handle that. Now, best practices when it comes to respondents, um, I believe that a lot of you probably from your educations did some research in university or in master's, in working on your master's degree, where you became familiar with the Institutional Review Board. They are responsible for reviewing uh, research protocols for human subject when human subjects are uh, in use and this has all been defined and standardized by health and social services. Um, it's very uh, long and involved but primarily all of those rules come down to respecting the well-being of the respondent, the safety of the respondent, protecting uh, vulnerable populations, and that sort of thing. Uh, there are situations where an IRB review is mandated. I don't think that's very typical for the kind of work that you're doing, but I'm happy to talk more about that later if you're, you're curious or need more information. Um, a, using a culturally responsible approach is more than just thinking about language. When you go to the literature and start looking at culturally responsible uh, evaluation, what you'll find is that it, these efforts and this thinking is rooted in uh, early studies in formal education for the separate but equal uh, black and white or segregated school systems. and. So a lot of research was done there, and the populations become can become suspicious about the reason for the research. Are they going to lose programming or lose funding based on this? So you'll find that the literature and the thinking is rooted there, and rightly so. And essentially, what culturally responsible approach to evaluation asks you to do is be aware of situation for the population that you are studying. Be sensitive to their fears and their history with this kind of thing and be sure to have representation of that uh, population on your team as you're developing the research. Uh, I had a talk with someone at the October conference about this. There's a terrific uh, chapter I can recommend in a, um, that I'm happy to share. Uh, at, at a later date. It's very useful. It's not rocket science. Also, as you're designing your protocol and your questions, you want the content to be accessible and relevant and understandable by your respondent. Uh, never assume literacy. Always offer to read something out loud with someone um, if that's necessary for your protocol. And, and then if they say, no, it's okay, you don't need to read it to me, then you're fine. So in general, the protocol design for a structured interview is quite similar for questionnaires. You want to start off with a brief explanation of the purpose of your survey. So why is it that you're taking this person's time? And it's nice to start easy. You kind of break the ice. Uh, is this the first time you've been here? Is uh, something easy that gets sort of establishes that you're asking the questions, they're answering the questions, and it's friendly and it's not threatening. Eventually, as you build some rapport, then you can dig into the more difficult or more complex kinds of content. 
I've been advising graduate students at JFKU on their uh, interview protocols, and it's not uncommon for them to very early on just jump to the to the biggest question like what was the budget or what do you think didn't work in this program and I'll often comment to them and say hey you know you didn't even buy me a drink yet you can't go go right there uh, let's start easy um, uh, similarly starting with discussing the positive side of whatever the topic is you're exploring before looking at a uh, negative side is also helpful I tend to think of uh, um, I tend to break my research question down into areas of inquiry. So in the course of an interview, I'll, ha I'll address maybe three areas of inquiry. And I'll start with a clear question addressing that. I like to start open-ended and then to see what they're going to offer me. Then I have my prompts and follow-up questions already thought out such that if the initial response they give me hits my points, great, we can move on. If not, I'm prepared with a sort of a safety net to be sure and pull out of them the points that I need. And I've got some examples of that coming up. So generally starting open-ended and then zeroing in into more detail is a useful way to have these conversations or these interviews with people. At the very end in the wrap-up, it it can be useful to get very direct about your research goal if your research questions merit that. So for instance, right now I'm talking to uh, visitors who are watching a new planetarium show that has two different parts, a live part and a uh, movie sort of projected part. And so I'm asking them questions all along the way about what are the experiences, what are they learning, did they get this from the live part or the other part, and then at the very end we're finishing the interview with, so the people who created this are very interested in how these two parts work together. Do you have any thoughts for me on that? And so it's a good catch-all in case they haven't really gotten specific enough for me. I would never start the interview with that, uh, but to wrap up, is an, it's a nice little capstone. Another nice little wrap up to use can be, so of all the things we discussed today, what do you think is most important for the people who run this program? Um, it's also nice to wrap up with, is there anything else you'd like to share? Is there anything else you think we should know? Or what, what have I not asked you that I should ask you? These kinds of things, uh, good catch-alls and nice useful little wrap ups. Okay, so Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you for our first poll question, and we'll see if I've been able to pe keep people awake out there. All right, everyone. So again, we have our first poll question. I'm going to launch it right now, so you'll see it prompted on your screen. Question is, how well do you think this webinar is going? Please select one of the following. Extremely well, very well, somewhat well, it's okay. Or wait, there's something wrong with this question. So we're going to give you just a few moments to respond. Okay, so it looks like 44% of you said very well, 22% said somewhat well, 22% it's okay, and 11% said, wait, there's something wrong with this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I really opened myself up to that one. In fact, there's something terribly wrong with this question. Um, first of all, it's steeped in bias, uh, and the responses are in the wrong order. Technically when you're giving a scale like this uh, you'll start with the negative and go towards the positive. Um, it can bias responses when you're dealing with big samples. Um, and this is also not the kind of question that you would use in a structured interview. In a structured interview you want to use uh, fixed, fixed response questions like this as a springboard for conversation. 
Okay, so moving right along. Another thought about protocol design for your situation, I, a lot of you I know use uh, a sort of a, a form of structured interview as for the intake process. That is a very specific kind of situation where the, the respondent has come to you, is seeking services, um, they haven't been recruited for the sake of the interview. Um, the nature of the interaction is to share and collect a lot of really personal information. So there's going to be a lot of that, even maybe up at the front end of the conversation. And uh, caseworkers who are used to talking with people are comfortable working from unscripted forms. Some of you have shared with me your intake forms, and I've seen the things they use here. And they're definitely not scripted as questions. It's the caseworker and the client sitting together filling out a form. So the kinds of structured interviews I'm talking about go beyond that a little bit and I hope that you can get some nuggets from these this this other kind of approach that you can bring to your protocol or for, to your intake process. Let's see. All right, so when it comes to you, you've established what the purpose is for your research, you've taken in feed uh, input from all the stakeholders, you've decided that the structured interview is the base, best approach for your research questions or the effort you're dealing with right now and it's time and you understand it's nice to start easy and then dig into the more difficult content when it comes to actual questions there are just a couple things on this slide I want to call out um, nice to know questions are really problematic uh, so by defining your research purpose and your research questions early on, it's easy for you to prevent nice to know questions from uh, nosing onto your uh, protocol. Every question needs to have a purpose for being there and take my word for it, if you collect a bunch of extra data that you don't need, you're going to regret it later um, because it's a lot of extra work for no real purpose. Um, by double barrel questions, I mean things that are asking two, uh, two questions at once. Say, for instance, was the program presenter well informed and well organized? Uh, those are two different things. So if someone says yes to that question or no to that question, you're not sure which, you can't be which item they're really responding to. Um, also this idea of giving people permission to disagree or be candid. Um, one way to do that, because remember the courtesy bias when you're talking with people face to face. So one way to sort of give people permission is at the very beginning, say, we all, everyone likes to get a pat on the back, but where we really learn is from constructive criticism or helpful criticism. So please don't be shy about sharing with me your frank feedback. You can also build that kind of permission into an individual question with something like, we know that opinions can vary on this program. Uh, I'm wondering how you, what your opinion is. Uh, so again, you want to give people permission to share things with you that might not be perfectly uh, happy or positive. And this idea of using fixed responses, if you are using a rating scale or something or a list of things for people to choose from, it's nice to have a little printout for them. If I'm on the floor working fast, I'll have it taped to the back of my clipboard uh, so people can respond quickly that way. Um, otherwise, you can have it printed out on a little card or a piece of paper to share with someone that you're speaking to in person, uh, you know, se seated. And again, uh, fixed response questions in the context of an interview should be considered springboards for conversation. They're not uh, to stand on their own. So I've talked a lot about st op started off starting off in an open-ended way and then zeroing in by having your premeditated prompts in place. Um, so this slide talks about prompts when somebody isn't forthcoming. Sometimes it takes a little to pull on people. So here are some useful prompts to get people going with this kind of question about, you know, I'm just looking for feedback on today's workshop. Um, and I don't need to read these out loud to you, but you can get the idea of just kind of priming the pump and helping people get rolling. When 
a response is forthcoming, it's nice to be ready with follow-ups or probes to dig in a little bit. Um, so was it new information for you? How will it be useful? How might you be able to use it? That kind of thing. It's good to think about these things in advance so you're ready to roll when you're having your interview. And that pre-planning and understanding your purpose will help you understand how to craft those questions and follow-ups. So as I've said several times, fixed response is nice to have uh, the visual aid and also consider use it, in, use it to fuel more conversation. And so ratings, uh, multiple choice and rating scales, ranking things can also be useful uh, if you're looking to get opinions on different things and really force people to rank them as opposed to rate them individually. A fun one that people usually have an easy time responding to is, what are three words that describe the program you attended today? Uh, and you can either leave it at that or take an op the opportunity to dig into one or all of them, depending on your time, um, but dig into one that is interesting and uh, this can be help conversation flow and get people going. And it's also easy data to manage. As I mentioned, when you're in conversation with somebody as opposed to having them fill out a form, it gives you the opportunity to do more than just ask questions. Um, I like using images for this kind of effort. Um, I will say, if you're using images to help people reflect on an idea, it, it can be helpful because people have a hard time thinking about something in the abstract but they can also get too attached to the specificness of the image that you're using. So one way to avoid letting people get too concrete is to have several images that are basically on the same idea in order to help that without letting them fixate too much on one image. Um, card sorts are also a really pleasant way uh, to sort of break up the Q&A of an interview and also answer good questions. So um, printing a little set of images or of phrases on cards that then the respondent can sort is a, is a little task that can be tailored to answer myriad questions. So preferences of things, familiarity with things, likelihood of behaviors or choices. Uh, very useful and again uh, kind of break up the activity and make it more enjoyable for everybody. So the more you do these interviews the more these kinds of things become uh, second nature to you. Uh, so here's just a little question bank of uh, useful follow-up questions. the way you say these things makes all the difference in the world. Uh, so it's all about tone of voice and being sensitive to the dynamic because of course these questions could come off very pushy but they can also be presented in a friendly way. I like to have my research assistants think of themselves as a neutral but friendly extension of the survey instrument. They're not out there to make friends uh, they have a job to do, but it's best done in a friendly manner. Now there can be situations where the respondent has a lot of their own questions, uh, which is fine if they are relative to the interview, great, then it becomes a part of the conversation. If they're adjacent to the interview, then I will have people explain to the respondent, I'm happy to answer your questions uh, as soon as we're done with the interview. It can be hard for the interviewer to just pose a question and wait for an answer. Blank space, uh, quiet space can make people uncomfortable, but that's part of the process. Giving someone a moment to collect their thoughts and come back with you a response with a response is natural, but again, be ready with prompts if they really are hemming and hawing or need a little bit of help. I find it helpful and very clarifying to use people's language back at them if I'm looking for uh, clarification of what it is they've just said. So, you know, when you say it was crystal clear to you, what exactly do you mean by that? 
Now, sometimes as the interviewer, it's helpful to come off just a little dim, like I can probably guess at what you mean when you tell me something was crystal clear, but by asking it in an open-ended way, I give you an opportunity to provide more reflection and think a little bit more deeply about it. Now, you don't want to be too dim and make the person respondent seem like this is a stupid exercise and you're wasting their time, um, but it can be a useful technique when you don't overdo it. And um, not, not narrating the process, that last bullet point, I, that comes from listening to interviewers who are uncomfortable having open space in the conversation. Stick to the clear opening question. You don't talk about, oh, now it's our next question, or I've got just one more question. Sometimes those can be useful segues, but don't rely on them. Keep it nice and clean. The more extra language that gets spewed into the question confuses the point and makes the effort, makes it a little more work for the respondent to understand what it is, that, what the question is that you're presenting. So leading the witness is sometimes an allowable thing, but not in this kind of situation. It's important to use neutral vocabulary um, and open-ended questions and premeditated prompts that don't inject vocabulary or judgments that they might then begin to fixate on. Uh, natural little mm-hmm and nodding the head like you do in active listening is perfectly fine, but again, you can't have your little encouraging mm-hmm things be injected with uh, any kind of judgmental uh, sen sensitivity of a or sense of a judgmental uh, thing like, this is a great observation. Oh yeah, I really agree with that. And I have been training interviewers and I do hear that. So it sounds obvious, but it's easy as humans for us to slip into that kind of conversational mode. As I was working with one of my current interviewers on this, she said, oh yeah, I realize I have to stay in character. And I thought that that was a useful way of thinking about it. I also like this idea of sometimes just not finishing the sentence as a way of prompting or bringing people out. So so would you mean, so does that mean you feel, and just let them take it from there. Uh, very effective tool. When you're audio recording, of course your respondent needs to know that they're being recorded and give permission for it. So it's good to establish in advance that recording will be done and then on the recording itself point out okay I'm starting the recorder or do I have your permission to record and get a verbal okay from the person and capture that on tape it's just part of your best practices and being respectful of respondents I always prefer audio recording if I can do that because then I can really concentrate on the respondent and concentrate on the conversation I don't have to worry about notes of course, that makes a bigger effort and a more expensive effort because then you've got transcription and your data is a lot thicker. Handwritten notes force a much quicker interaction um, and thinner responses. Always the goal is to get 100% verbatim uh, responses captured from the respondent, but that can be very difficult. So. It may be that you're capturing key phrases, key vocabulary, and then immediately after the interview going back to your notes and filling in the blanks as quickly as, as soon as you can. Sometimes when a person, I mean, if I'm in this mode and a person launches into something conversational, uh, my notes will say long conversation about you know, whatever, and with a little bit of a narrative description, and then I'll go back and fill in as much as, as much as I can. Don't worry about taking a little time to write down the responses. The respondent can see that you have a job to do. Sometimes to fill the air as I'm writing down the response, I'll sort of say out loud what it is I'm writing, so it's kind of checking back with them that I'm trying to be accurate and keeping their attention with me as I finish that process. And I know uh, a lot of the caseworkers here at SWORDS will um, enter 
responses into the database during the in, right into the computer while well, during an intake, and others work on paper and then later do that database entry. Uh, if you are working at the keyboard, I would just say be sure you're making a human connection with the respondent who's sitting there with you and uh, take time to make eye contact and converse about things, um, even if you then have to turn to the, uh, to the keyboard and do your entry. So I'm guessing that when it comes to your client data and tracking, you've you're probably working with custom databases not unlike uh, what they've got at SWORDS. And so if that fits, if you can make that work for whatever other research efforts you're doing with uh, structured interviews, that's great. If not, it's easy to use Microsoft Excel or even SurveyMonkey. Uh, SurveyMonkey now has keyword finding tools uh, as well as um, it can spit out uh, uh, graphs for you in, in the summary function, which I'm, you, some of you are probably familiar with. Even if you aren't working online, you can use SurveyMonkey as a data entry tool. So if you've done your um, hand-recorded uh, structured interviews and now you've got the data to enter, you can type it into a SurveyMonkey questionnaire that's made to match your uh, interview protocol. And then you've, that SurveyMonkey can spit it out in Excel for you where you can manipulate it or sit, spit out the summary for you. The word search tool in SurveyMonkey is pretty rudimentary, but it can be a useful start. When you hear people talking about coding open-ended data, really that's just a process of categorizing the responses. Um, and one response can certainly fall into more than one category. I have some materials I can share with you through Megan um, about using Excel sheets for that if you are interested in learning more about it. It's not hard to fillet uh, an interview into an Excel sheet and uh, then code the data by question. As I mentioned earlier, uh, an analysis, full coding and analysis is a whole other workshop uh, idea and we'd be happy to do that if that would be of interest and be useful for you. And Megan, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Okay, so now we, have the, now we have the second poll question. So I'm going to go ahead and launch it so you'll see it prompted on your screen. Question is, how would you rate the usefulness of this webinar? Please select one of the following. Very useful, somewhat useful, not very useful, about as useful as this question is without an opportunity uh, to, sorry, it's cut off, <laughs> to follow up, I assume. And to follow up about the rating I give. Okay, perfect. Um, and then last is more useful than number four, so the fourth option suggests. So we're going to give you a few seconds to respond. All right, so we have 38% said somewhat useful, 13% not very useful, and 38% said about as useful as this question is without opportunity to follow up. <laughs> okay, so again, I opened myself up for that. Um, if we were talking face to face and you had told me somewhat not very useful or number four, which is indeed not very useful, um, I, my follow up for you would be, what could have made this more useful? So I'm going to ask you that right now, and Megan, maybe you can receive uh, uh, the chat chatting responses from folks. Is there an, perhaps an area of structured interviews that I didn't cover, or maybe an, an application of them that I didn't cover that would have made this more useful? 
So you can go ahead and submit that via the questions box on the right side of your webinar's display or the chat box. And I will relay it to Wendy. Okay. And then um, while people are typing, I'll just say about this question, it underscores the importance of being able to follow up. Ratings aren't terribly useful. If, even if some of you had said very useful, which, which would have been nice, but I get it, um, I would still want to know why. What was useful about it? Just as I'd want to know what could have made it more useful for you. Um, also, this question's a little bit problematic because Again, this is just a tool for me to have this conversation with you, but in real life, these number three and four are kind of conflicting, and five is a little bit weird. So, again, you'd want to be much more clear in your structure for a real fixed response question and not have responses that potentially overlap with each other. But I did this to make a point. So we do have one comment that came in. Um, they said, more examples of specific questions. Okay, now we do have the, oh, and you know what, that, uh, we do have the PowerPoint, excuse me, not the PowerPoint, the PDF? Yes, so on the right side of your display, everyone, um, if you click to expand um, handouts, you will see that you can click on a document there and it's available for you to download. It's titled Questions Bank, Structured Interview Workshop, and it's a PDF document. Okay, I want to open it up, but I'm not, let's see. Okay, Megan, why am I not finding it? Um, oh, oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Got it? Okay. I think so. There we are. <laughs> uh. Someone else just chimed in too and said more examples of what research goals might be. Okay, great. So if this can, will that little window go away? Okay. So um, research goals in the context of your program, wor the world of your kinds of programs primarily, um, uh, employment and employment training, if you are doing trying to do an evaluation of the program, then lot, very typical kinds of research goals can be phrased like, to what extent does X program achieve and then whatever it is you've set out to do. So if, um, if you're, you're, say your program is setting out to provide transitional housing and ultimately permanent housing for the clients that come to you or that you work with. Um, to what extent does X program assist people into transitional housing? To what extent does the traditional to transitional housing program enable people to step into permanent housing? And then, so these are your overarching research goals. And your sub-questions will be things like, okay, well, how many, um, you will be looking at output as well as outcomes. So how many people are getting into transitional housing? And what types of barriers have they overcome in order to get into transitional housing? What are they still needing to address in order to step into permanent housing? So you'll have sub-questions like this. And, you know, how effectively does the program help when substance abuse is an issue? How effectively does the program help when um, previous uh, convictions are a problem? So you'd have your overarching question of to what to what degree is this happening successfully, and then your sub-questions which look at the details, the underpinnings that have to be in place for that overarching question to be able to be reached. Um, so, for instance, in my world, in the museum world, I'm often looking at to what extent does this program get people to consider their own behaviors when it comes to recycling or climate change or that kind of thing? And they are specifically 
broad like that so that you then have to identify what are the sub bits of that that need to be in place. So when it comes to specific questions, this is a really helpful thing that Megan turned me on to. They have, the SWORDS has this toolkit and there's a live link here for you in the first paragraph. And th that toolkit includes a page of really thoughtful questions when considering employment programs and employment training programs. Uh, so when she shared those with me anticipating this workshop and so I, what I thought would be helpful is to sort of translate those into how I would create a, a protocol. So as I say in the introduction here, this isn't a full interview protocol, right? Think of this as a research, or excuse me, as a thought exercise in how to take some of these really thoughtful questions and translate them into a conversational structured interview. So um, this, I also like this example from her because it chunks up into what I consider sort of areas of inquiry. So her questions are listed a little differently here than you'll see them in the online uh, toolkit. So um, under the big heading of employment planning, a subheading or a, a, you could consider it an area of in, um, inquiry also serving as an introduction to the conversation. The question that I'm riffing off of that was on Megan's list is the top one here. Um, did the veteran lead the planning? So this is one of their thoughtful things that they want to know about the program. I when I kind of retooled this into what could be a useful conversational interview, you'll see what I did there in orange. Um, so after you have your pleasant greetings and your brief statement about the purpose of the interview, you can start with your open-ended questions. So give me an idea of, the pro of how this program works. And by the way, let me back up a sec. This is sort of an, um, an idea of an uh, instrument Protocol, or protocol chunks that would be useful for, say, talking to another agency if you were considering partnering or somehow working together in, in this uh, programmatically. So with that in mind, having a pleasant opening and then this open-ended beginning. So tell me, give me an overview of the program. How does it work? And then depending on what that person feeds you, you're ready to follow up with specific things you want to learn about, namely, did the veterans, how does the veteran participate? Again, it's open-ended. And then follow up with, can they play a leadership role in the process? And then you would have, uh, again, other questions you would have thought out in advance. These are just translating those thoughtful questions into what could be a protocol. Um, another question that came from Megan had to do with wraparound services. And I thought touching on that up here at the beginning when you're getting an overview of the program would be a good place to broach that initially. The next uh, uh, area of inquiry is here um, related to wraparound services. So this also makes kind of a nice segue. Now we're going to dig into uh, wraparound services a little bit. Here these black questions were Megan's original very thoughtful ones. And then this is how I would translate it into that conversational interview. So again, starting open-ended. Tell me about the, how the program addresses barriers. And depending on where they go with that, I'm ready to go, well, how do you assess? And do you review the disability benefits and all these other questions that I'm ready to catch up on if they haven't volunteered that from my open-ended one? And next area of inquiry is matching the job seeker to the job. So these are the thoughtful questions that actually were in pretty good shape for interview use. Um, I didn't have to change them very much. But um, so tell me about how the veterans get matched up with their job placements but then I'm already ready to dig into the details that I also really need. By starting open-ended on all of these, I may learn things I didn't think to ask about or learn nuances about the program that might not have come out if, we limited my, if I limited myself to just these uh, follow-ups. The, another uh, type of interview is this employment retention. And so it's a whole other area of inquiry. Again, here are the thoughtful questions that um, I was riffing off of. So I would start very open-ended. Do you have a retention program in effect? You know, how do you work with employers to support job retention? And then the follow-ups, which came from Megan's thoughtful work up here.
And then reflection and evaluation. Um, again, these are really important questions for your ability to work well and be funded. So again, starting off a little, these thoughtful questions which guide us and then translating it into the questions I would maybe use or at least pilot test. So do you have a process for assessing outcomes? And because outputs and outcomes can confuse people, I would I define it in this question. And so outcomes meaning changes in the life of the veteran with your follow-ups. Again, premeditated follow-ups. And I also like the idea of looking not just at the outcomes for the clients, but do you have a means of assessing the process? So that's evaluating your own um, process internally. And that's this is um, a question from Megan uh, that I was riffing off of for that. Not something I would have known to ask. Um, and not something someone might volunteer either. Again, you would be thinking in advance of what it is you need to know based on your research objectives. And there's the question of the year, huh? Measuring uh, impact of wraparound services. I hope that helps to make it a little bit more concrete with uh, the kinds of questions and um, conversational style of building up those areas of inquiry. Megan, are you getting any chats? Nothing else has come in. Okay. So I think we can continue on. Did any other questions come in or points about what would have made this more useful when we just when we broached that a few minutes ago? Oh yeah, those were the only two that came in regarding that. So um, I think the person okay. who posed them had the right questions. Alrighty. Uh, we and do have also, some questions that we'll save for the end too. Oh, okay, well I'm actually, I think we're there. Okay. <laughs> and I was going to say, a lot of times these things are pretty situational. Um, so if folks out there are working on designing protocols or struggling with clarifying uh, research questions, I'm happy to kibitz with folks on the phone um, and get to get more specific for their situation, or if they want to float something, you know, email something to me, I'm happy to look at it and comment on it. Okay, everyone. So we'd like to open up with a discussion with you all. If you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them via the question or chat box on the right side of your screen, and we'll do our best to go through them all. If you've asked a question at any time during the training, we will address those now as well. So we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, so this is a this is one about um, resources in-house. So how do we do this? How do we do structured interviews with few resources and in-house knowledge? Um, can employment staff admin administer these interviews or is there an inherent courtesy bias? Also how can we utilize volunteers for this effort, if at all? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's always going to be a courtesy bias, but every situation is different. And, you know, when you're talking to someone that you've known for a long time, they've been working for, for a long time, there may be more willingness to be candid, especially if you've given that person permission. Um, using in-house staff can, ex can exacerbate that uh, uh, bias, the courtesy bias. So for some of those questions, you might want to use a self-completed instrument so that respondents can feel more protected by anonymity and be more frank. As when it comes to staff, uh, yeah, this is why you need to match the research tool, not just your research question, but to your situation and what are your logistics and what are your resources. Um, it's not just 
manpower, it's also time and how quickly you need to turn things around and understand what the data are telling you. So my hesitation with using volunteer, my, so my hesitation with using staff for this kind of data collection depends on what the research question is and what kind of bias we could be uh, engendering by using staff. Uh, the problem with using volunteers is they are also sort of insiders and then you have the question of interview skill set. So um, if you have interview, or if, excuse me, if you have volunteers that uh, you think are you know, sharp enough to either have already done this kind of work and understand how to be an interviewer, that's great. If you have folks that are, you think can be trained up and uh, step up to the task, that is also great. There are a lot of resources for training and um, I can share a, a URL too. It occurs to me, um, I've got a primer out there um, that I can share through Megan. Um, one thing to consider when you're doing data collection is the fewer data collectors, the better because then your data is more consistent and then it's going to be more useful. Uh, so if you are using volunteers or staff, uh, a comprehensive training is important and everyone at the table needs to know the purpose of the research so that they can use the prompts and probes appropriately and not go off into the weeds. So yeah, it's difficult when, you're, when your budget and time are tight, so training up a couple good volunteers would be, I think, pretty strategic. And someone also asked, what about grad students for that effort? that might have uh, more advanced training. <laughs> yeah, grad students can be really, really good for this. Um, on the one hand, grad students have a lot to prove, right? I, I love using grad students when I can um, because they really want to show me how good they are because they have, they're getting resume fodder. My problem has been, not always, but often, that grad students spread themselves very thin and then they are either hard to get at or they, they show up for data collection and they're just too sleepy because they're doing three or four jobs or whatever. So I have learned the hard way uh, when I'm interviewing grad students to really look and see what else is on their plate. Uh, because I can't have somebody showing up too exhausted to have a conversation and I have run into that. But they, like I said, they can be eager to prove themselves and that's a useful thing. Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, but still, even, one more word on it, even, mm -hmm. even given that, even if they have a little experience, you need to go through their training, you know, um, and train them yourself and make sure they understand the purpose of your research and your instrument and how to use it and some of these basic tips um, you need to be clear that you've had that conversation even if they come they tell you they have interviewing experience. Great we've also um, at Source of Plowshares we've used grad students um, that are that may be doing a project specifically on um, coding qualitative analysis um, so they're not actually doing the structured interviews but they can help us with that data analysis portion, which is pretty useful. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so another question that came in, and I apologize that I didn't ask you as you were running through it, um, that portion of the presentation. Um, they asked, can you talk specifically um, about having a culturally responsible approach, specifically as it pertains to the veteran community? Yes, and um, really the swords or sword staff are expert in this and so the example I've learned a lot being here this year and watching Shannon's trainings and I know those of you who were here in October got a taste of that as well so being sensitive to the physical conditions in the space if you potentially are dealing with someone that has PTSD what might their triggers be um, uh, so uh, to me that would translate into not just the wording of the questions but physically how I set up the arrangement for sitting together for the interview. Um, I think that when it comes to the vet population it, like recruiting for the interview could present some interesting challenges. So for instance in, in a normal daily life 
for me in data collection, I'm out somewhere on the museum floor and I'm randomly selecting visitors off the floor to, and inviting them to come and do my survey with me. Um, and that's much different from working in the population where you are, where you know you're talking to vets and that they may have these kinds of challenges that they bring. So being sensitive to all those things in Shannon's training about how to communicate with people, how to receive them, recognize that one of the one of the things I think would maybe come out is a, a lot of profanity. Um, so if your respondent is using a lot of profanity, understanding that that's part of the culture will go a long way. Uh, if I didn't prep an interviewer for that who's been working for me in the field elsewhere, that would be really difficult for them. Um, so I feel like you guys know the vet audience better than I do, but thinking about that perspective as you plan your protocol and your physical logistics are going to be really important. Thank you so much for that question. And also knowing acronyms and um, specific terms that might relate to the military <laughs> too is always helpful. Um, yeah, that's huge. That's huge. So uh, just before we move on real quick, Wendy, if you can uh, go to the last PowerPoint slide that has your contact information so that people can write that down oh, as yes. we're going through the For questions. Sure. Yeah, me... And then I'll wait just a moment to ask you okay. the next question. Um, okay, so next question um, from Bobby Nixon. If an interview starts open-ended and the interviewer loses the ability to guide the interview and the responses, what are some techniques and strategies used to effectively guide the interview in the appropriate direction? Well, hopefully your pre-planned uh, prompts and probes will be there and you can help anchor yourself to that. Sometimes people have a lot to get off their chest and one of the reasons I sometimes start very open-ended is so they can vent that and then their mind is more clear to answer my questions. So um, f as an example, the, the I was just telling you about the planetarium show thing. I know people are going to be bubbling over when they come out and so I can't, my first question can't be, gee, what was your biggest takeaway? My first question has to be, wow, how did you like the show? And then they can kind of vent, get what whatever's on the tip of their tongue, they can get off of their chest and so they know they've been heard. The thing that they was really wanting to say has been heard, then they can kind of settle down and join me with the questions and let me guide the conversation more easily that way. If I did, if I do find myself in a conversation getting pulled away uh, from my goal uh, or you know my protocol, I will politely let the person finish the thought um, and Sometimes I need to interject if they're really just going on and not reading my body language and, and understanding that I'm trying to move us back. I might interrupt and say, I'd love to talk to you some more about that after the interview, but for now I need to get back to this. It's okay to recognize that you, the interviewer, has a job to do. Again, you're friendly, but you're not the new friend. So bringing, bringing the person's attention back to the job to do by after acknowledging whatever there is going off about and maybe promising to come back to that later after you finish this task. It, does that sound helpful? I think so and Bobby if you need to follow up on that then uh, feel free in the questions box. Um, so we have a, a and oh, excuse me, so Megan, sorry. Mm -hmm. So that um, points up another thing that you'll find. Uh, humans they're not always that cooperative, right? So they might not answer the question you're asking. <laughs> they might ask answer a previous question and then eventually kind of get around to it. So that's why it is good to have your prompts and everything really ready so that you can follow where they go if you have to. Um, and then when you're doing your data entry, sometimes I'll realize, wow, this person's response to question five really fits what we were talking about in question four. So that's part of cleaning up your data. And that does happen because as much as we want them to do whatever we say or whatever we want, those pesky humans aren't always cooperative. <laughs> All right. And Bobby said, yes, that was clear. Thank you. Oh, good. good. Um, so a couple more questions that have come in. Um, can you talk a little bit about follow-up prompts to pre-formulated questions? So if, per se, you're adding a follow-up question based on a certain person's experience, but you haven't asked 
other respondents the same question. How reliable is that data from the one respondent in your research? Okay, so if I understand the question, um, you're getting at the, a certain amount of inconsistency. Uh, something, it, something comes to the surface in one interview that hadn't shown up in other interviews. Yes. If you, if you find that um, this is one reason to pilot test, and one reason to start open-ended, in, in, in fact, even before you've got your official uh, structured interview protocol the proto to, to, to pilot test, if you've done your little bit more open-ended conversations with people, hopefully you've covered the gamut of what kinds of things to expect such that you have structured or, or designed your structured interview protocol to try and account for that. If you find that people are constantly coming up with stuff that you didn't anticipate once you start your structured interviews, you might not have done enough of that pilot thinking yet. Um, and also, if you know if that comes out early in your process, maybe you need to adjust your uh, protocol to to have a safety net for that or to accommodate for that in your f uh, subsequent interviews. Okay. Also, remember um, what we didn't talk about in detail because I just I leapt into the method. You're, when you're dealing with qualitative research versus quantitative research, um, qualitative research, especially if you're using smallish samples, which is not unusual because qualitative research is a little more costly of an effort. Um, the uh, Qualitative research can show you the range of things that are happening out there, not necessarily the frequency of those things. So if in your data one guy came up with this weird, weird com, um, experience or answer that doesn't show up anywhere else, that doesn't mean it's not valid. It means that there's evidence of this out, out there in that population and it might suggest further research down the road. Okay. So one last question here. Um, there, there are actually two people that asked this, so I'll combine the question. Um, how are funders relying on this information when they make decisions on grants? That's the first question that came in. Follow-up said, can we get examples of how to write evaluation into a grant application? Yes, yay, I love these questions. Okay, so one of the big uses of evaluative findings is in grant proposals to say, we've got this successful track record. We did this study on the stuff, that, you know, on this X program we're asking you to fund, and we know it has these impacts. And we'll even send you a copy of the report if you want. Super powerful. And, um, I have more to say about grant things, um, but yes, and in terms of designing, in, including in a grant proposal, this is the kind of evaluation we'll do on the program that we're asking you to fund so that we can prove to you your money has been well spent. So evaluation we already did proves to you that we're capable of doing this. The evaluation we're designing for the program you're about to fund will help you feel comfortable because we're going to verify for you that we're, we, we've succeeded in helping meet your mission. So um, yeah, absolutely you can include uh, research, uh, evaluative uh, research design in your grant. Now some funders, re in my experience, some funders require a completely, completely um, designed uh, evaluation program. NSF will require that the evaluation be created before they'll fund anything at all. Um, I'm, not all funders are that specific. So you can say, you know, we'll use a variety of qualitative and quantitative tools in uh, a survey and possibly interviews with people who will participate and that kind of thing. You can definitely describe that to whatever level of detail suits the, um, the RFP for your proposal. So it's a little hard for me to be really concrete about that. Um, 
you have to you might if you have page limitation you might not be able to say a lot about that um, but I'm happy to kibitz with you about it I, I find when I work with a team who's writing a grant proposal it's my job to write or provide language for the evaluation section and a really important part of that process for the team is almost always me helping them get clear on the program goals what what outputs excuse me what outcomes do they want to generate and the way they describe those is important the kind of verbiage you use is important so that you've generated something that actually is testable and actually is measurable so um, it's important to work with your evaluator on crafting that so that you can create a, an actual realistic evaluation plan for it and again how much detail in a plan you need to describe in the plan will vary with your funder, uh, the proposal process, how many pages you're allowed, and all of that. Great, and we this can. This gets me happy and excited, though. And I'm again, I'm happy to kibitz with you if any of you are struggling with trying to clarify those kinds of goals or research goals or instruments, as I mentioned earlier. And do you have any like examples that you can send out, Wendy? I know we, we do at SWORDS of some evaluation protocol on our combat to community trainings that might be useful to people um, that we'd be happy to send out. Yeah, that would be great of you to share that. My, I mean, I do this all the time, but it's, it's such a different field. I mean, I'm looking at education, informal education, and um, programmatic experiences that are, are different enough. I, I'll go back and, and think about that, but your examples I think are going to be a little more useful because you're in the con right content area. Okay, great. All right, so we don't have any more questions that have come in thus far, um, but if anyone has any last minute thoughts or questions, feel free to type that now and I'll just um, hold off on closing the webinar for a minute or so just in case anyone has any last minute questions. <laughs> All right, so it looks like nothing else has come in, but you guys had some great questions and thoughts, so thank you for participating. Um, so this concludes this presentation. Thank you to Wendy. And thank you to you, our attendees. We will archive this presentation on our YouTube channel within the next few business days, and we'll send you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation as well as the materials that we referenced in the handout. So thank you for your time. This concludes our workshop, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>